This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly match it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around <laughs> their mouth. Uh, welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Staff Canteen. Um, and this is the fifth episode with my co-host, uh, Stephen Edwards from Etch in Brighton, uh, also former Master Professionals winner. Um, as it is back on our on our screens at the minute, everybody that we are speaking to is, uh, is a previous winner. Um, you can catch up on all of them wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, just search for Grilled by The Staff Canteen. Stephen. So, that's good. Mark Stinchcomb, welcome to Grilled. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excited to be here. You won't be once we finish with you. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> it sounds ominous, that does. <laughs> it's not really. It's not really. I'm just. Oh. I'm just. <laughs> um, how do you uh, How do you know each other? Firstly, uh, is it just through social media, or have you met previous to this? Well, um, Stephen actually asked me to go down to his restaurant at Etch to do a, um, a guest chef night. And that was actually the first time I'd met Stephen. But we'd had, had some contact over uh, social media before then. But it was lovely to go down and actually see Stephen's restaurant and kind of uh, meet him and, and his team. Stephen, there's not, there's not many of the, the MasterChef finalists you haven't had there, is there? Yeah, I've just got a little MasterChef Master Chef club going on down there. Too. <laughs> We're all his groupies. <laughs> But to be honest, like Mark was um, someone that I've been like following before MasterChef because he's like a serial competition winner. If you if you look at his uh, if you look at his history, his like background, it was always a chef that w- was basically winning everything. That was that. Well, that's kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you love? Then you get a bit of a buzz from competitions. I think I think it's just something completely different than being in the kitchen, and I think it's. I just like working and I think working to the recipes or working in a competition is very different than kind of just being in a kitchen doing the same kind of motions of service or creating the new dishes. So actually kind of putting yourself under a bit of time pressure or um, scrutiny kind of, I think, helped me kind of become the chef that I am today by pushing myself at that kind of young, early age to do the competitions. Yeah, it's not for everybody, though, is it? No, no, I don't think, I think some people get nervous. It's I've, like when people say, oh, how, how are you feeling when you first kind of walk into the room on MasterChef and bits and pieces? It, if you're confident in knowing what you've got to go in and do, I think it, I think it made it that little bit easier and kind of, I suppose, believing in yourself and knowing what you were going to put up was a, a, a good dish. But I'm, I'm confident that you have no nerves about our wheel of truth. So. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's get going. Um, Mark, as you're our guest, you can go first. Oh, lovely. <laughs> if you could live uh, anywhere, where would it be? Well, I've actually posed this question to my wife numerous amounts of times that I'd <laughs> like to actually go and live in Australia. Okay, so you've thought about this one. Oh, uh, I've, I've. I went across to, um, after leaving Champignon Sauvage in, I can't remember when it was, I, I went, uh, travelled, I did, I went to Singapore, uh, went to Australia, New Zealand, and I kind of fell in love with their ethos, the way that um, sport is a massive um, part of everyday life in Australia, um, cooking outdoors, the weather is obviously a little bit nicer than England, um, but I just think the food scene, um and was kind of moving forward so fast in Australia and 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 I would love to kind of I would have liked I would like to bring our children up in that sort of environment as well yeah is that somewhere you still 
I, ideally, if you if you could persuade Sue, <laughs> is uh, that where you would go? Yeah, massively. Yeah, I okay. think I think for I think that you saw. I think I saw a lot of family lifestyles getting a lot better due to that like, kind of living out there, and I, I'm quite outdoorsy and quite sporty. So actually, being able to kind of do that on a more regular basis would be lovely. Okay. Okay. Stephen, would you ever want to be anywhere other than than yeah, Brighton? I mean, I'd love to um I'd love to like live in Italy but like later on in my life I just love the whole culture I love the food scene um I always talk about uh, similar to what Mark was like, actually saying I always say it's like the um the three F's in Italy it's like food um family and football and uh, <laughs> you know that but that, they're like my passion so um I think it'd be a great country to live in I I would like to at some point live in a different country. I think it'd be really special. Good answers, both of those. Stephen, what really makes you angry? I don't get angry that often. Hopefully a lot of people will say that. But when I do get angry, I get really angry. And it, t it tends to be just like people that don't listen. So okay. you know, I've almost got like a free strike system in my head. Like if I've told someone <laughs> to do something once you know then the twice if they do it the third time I just lose lose my shit okay <laughs> <laughs> I can't ever imagine you losing your shit Stephen but I suppose I don't I don't push your buttons so it's all right <laughs> but not that the team at Edge they've only seen it happen like once or twice and they keep talking about it they're like can you remember that time that Stephen lost lost it and uh, <laughs> yeah it was funny Mark what about you? you does it take quite a lot for you to get across uh it I think I used to be quite calm and I think gradually as kind of through COVID and everything has progressed, I think I've gotten a lot like worse in that sort of sense. Okay. <laughs> I think having two children at a, a four and two kind of and sleep deprived, you kind of go into the kitchen already slightly jaded anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I th it's exactly like Stephen said, like, I think when you tell somebody something and it you are constantly repeating yourself or and they don't kind of necessarily get it and you're just kind of go it feels like that they go through the motions whereas I suppose for myself and Stephen like this has been our life this has been our passion this is our absolutely everything and then you see some people just kind of plodding through life at the expense of yourself, maybe? I was going to yeah. say that, like the opposite. I thought I was more shouty and aggressive when I first became a head chef. I felt like I had a point to prove. You know, it's like almost like when, when I got that uh, promotion, I was just, I must have been a horrible person to work for. I can't, I can't imagine that. Yeah. No, I was <laughs> that. I was just like, I wanted everything to be like perfect. And in my head, you know, like when you're a head chef, you're like, everything has to be like exactly how I want it I wanted to like lay down the rules but then over time like experience experience tells me like you know you're never going to achieve the you know perfection is just what whatever's in your head um and you know sometimes you have to let things slide sometimes you have to like mentor tutor and and take a different approach with the team otherwise you just end up with no, no one left at least you've got three strikes now. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> probably where the three strike system came from. Striking him out. Yeah, it went from you went from four staff to down to three, down to two. <laughs> oh, I'll get, I'll get the system in place now. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the most drunk that you've ever been, Mark? I get drunk but I get to a point where I know that I need to stop because I feel really ill I get really bad sickness when I drink too much so I oh, get yeah. to yeah so I get to a point and I'm like oh, I know I need to stop so usually I'm still coherent at that point um but yeah I can't even I it's been a long time it's been <laughs> a long time <laughs> even be my stag do actually okay Dressed as an old lady. <laughs> That's a good costume. Yeah. <laughs> Where were you on your stag do? Cardiff. Dressed as an old lady. Yeah. Uh, on on a, I think it was, there was a rugby and we uh, and football weekend in Cardiff as well. 
Wow. So there was a lot of people. Okay, sounds messy. Mm. <laughs> Stephen, what about you? Was your stag do up there? It wasn't actually. The stag do, I was like probably more more so because I was worried about what was going to happen. But to be honest, most times I go out, I go hard. And um, <laughs> like, it's, it's dangerous. Um, like, I just forget everything. Like, I'm going to be home at a certain time. I, I miss that. I think last time I went out with you, Cara, like, it started <laughs> off just as like a dinner. Then we're like going for like cocktails. And then the phone rings and it's Laura. She's just like, where are you? I'm just like, oh, I'm just in a cocktail bar. It was like three o'clock in the morning. I think. <laughs> but I was like so blasé. You know when you get like so drunk? I was just like so blasé. I was just like, what, why are you calling? She's like, it's three o'clock in the morning. Oh, God. <laughs> and you've got to look after the kids tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I just like my funniest story is like when I fell asleep on the train. It was like an all day session in London. I fell asleep on the train and woke up in, I, I live in Horsham. So it's about half an hour from Brighton. I woke up in Brighton train station at, I think that was about four o'clock in the morning and uh, I had to then get a taxi back and I was on breakfast the next day. Oh. So that was horrible. So I've popped some Christmas ones on because we are going to be in December when these come out. So um, what's your go-to uh, Christmas food or drink that really gets you in the mood for Christmas that you never eat the rest of the year, but you have to have it at Christmas time? That's a good one. I do these... Um, uh, like bellinis, like pancakes um, with uh, smoked salmon and creme fraiche and, and caviar. That's just like a little a little snack on Christmas nice. uh, that I, have, I don't have throughout the year. I love mince pies. Okay. That's a, that's mince pies one. and Bailey's hot chocolates. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Usually we make the girls hot chocolates anyway, but trying to put that bit, little bit of Bailey's, not in, not in theirs, but in ours. I've never had a Bailey's hot chocolate. I feel like oh, I need delicious. to try. Delicious. There we go. You've got a new go-to, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> and is the mince pie, is it hot mince pie or cold mince pie? Hot mince pie with a frangipan on top. Ooh. Oh, oh, nice. <laughs> Fancy of this old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stephen, what about you? Are you a mince pie lover or not? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah, I do love a mince pie. Yeah. Hot, cold, with... Any at any any temperature to be honest. I just love okay. eating. Okay. <laughs> if I've got time, if I've got the patience, then I'll heat it up. If not, I'm just gonna eat it cold. Okay, okay. <laughs> we're currently in the process with um with Sue with work. She's um doing a few bits from home and we're in currently in the process of making four thousand mince pies. So we've uh we've got a few mince pies on the go anyway at home. And she's oh, wow. them after making that many. I, I I just eat all the uh, all the broken ones. Anyone that isn't perfect, I've literally just been st stood in my kitchen just eating mince pies for about a month now. <laughs> I feel like when she's not looking, you're breaking mince pies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, final final one, I think. What is your biggest fear? I don't like heights. Is my biggest fear. Okay. I uh, when I when I was out in Australia, I was uh, renting a uh, renting a house, uh, renting like a a room in an apartment on the thirty eighth floor of a building in in Sydney, and um, there was ten of us living in this four bed apartment sort of thing, probably completely illegal. But um, there was people. There was actually somebody living on like the balcony that had a glass kind of roof sides and he was living on this like verand veranda um but the building actually had like four um four balconies all with glass barriers so they everyone used to sit and we used to drink out there everyone used to sit with their back against this glass balcony literally you could see everything in sydney and i struggled to get out the door when did you realize you had a fear of height um probably uh, it was quite a quite a while ago i my, we skipped to tenerife on holiday and my mum and dad wanted to take us up uh, up the is it mount tady um on the cable car and i just would not get on it okay okay i think it's fear of falling and dying i think is probably <laughs> it's not height <laughs> i guess you might think... 
I've telling. been skiing since and obviously been on the cable cars, but I think, oh, I could probably land in that snow and probably still survive. But I think falling out of 20, falling out of 38 story building in Sydney. Yeah. But you fly there as well. Yeah, I, it does worry me. <laughs> I, I'm a bit anxious, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I, think it, I can't even watch. I can't even watch videos on Instagram of people like looking over over an edge, um, like uh, v- v- films, bits and pieces where somebody's like climbing up a really tall ladder and look at like. Even that kind of sends my legs a bit funny. It makes you feel anxious. Does it? Maybe it's because I want to. Maybe because I want to jump. Maybe it's that feeling that you want to do it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, Stephen, what about you? What's your biggest fear? I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna say like deep water. You know, like if you're swimming in the sea and then you can't see like land and you're just like there. That that is a fear for me. But actually. Um, I was thinking more into it while Mark was talking. I don't know if you get this as well, Mark, but I have these like horrible nightmares, like um, where it's like a restaurant service and then I'm trying to like send food out, but no one's taking the food and then more checks <laughs> coming on. It's like a real like big like anxiety. That's, sort of. that's not a nightmare. That's just my general life. <laughs> <laughs> but like I wake up in the morning, I feel like so relieved, but it keeps, it's almost just like, I'm like, where is everyone? Why, why is the food not coming up? And I like, take this and the tickets are like building up building up building up that's probably my biggest fear it used to be the sound of the the uh, ticket yeah but we don't do uh, we don't do that anymore (laughs) for that reason (laughs) i remember doing a night dive in um at the coral reef and uh you're you're with i was with sue and, and the instructor and you're like literally diving and you are underwater it is completely pitch black and even just popping up and not knowing where the boat is and you're in the middle of the ocean that is daunting yeah. i don't mind i don't mind like scuba diving it's just i guess like you just said it's like not being able to get to land or like i think it's an orientation thing isn't it like you mm. have no no idea whereabouts you are what made you want to do a night dive i, I, I think we we were staying on a boat actually in the coral reef so it was, it, there wasn't very much else to do that night so it's actually like oh why don't you why don't you try it it was it was fun I think that would scare me actually. Mm. I don't know. Get... You, go, you go down and you've obviously yeah. got the torches and bits and pieces and you're trying to look around, but you are just, you can't look behind you because you can't see anything. You're literally just looking like straight ahead with no, you have no idea what's around you. Oh no, I don't think I'd like that. That's got like jaws written all over yeah. it, hasn't yeah. it? <laughs> right. Let's talk about MasterChef uh, away, away from the wheel. Um, so, Mark, when I spoke to you, um, when you when you won um you said one of the most challenging moments in the competition was the first day um do you think a lot of contestants feel like that and do you still feel like that now if you think about your time during MasterChef so I think probably Stephen remembers that you kind of you turn up at the studio at seven o'clock in the morning and you've got no idea kind of what is ahead of you what's in front of you and you get put into some kind of green uh, little kind of a porter cabin out the back and you are literally just waiting to call your name and I think I was the last person to go on uh, that day so literally you've been sat in a cabin for probably close to five hours just waiting one person going and then the next person so you are a little bit apprehensive and then they call your name and like away you go but as soon as you kind of walk through that door and you've got the lights, the cameras, you've never met the judges, you've never seen the cameras, the set, you've never been in that environment. So I think probably as soon as you get through that point, you, I think you feel a little bit more familiar with the surroundings. See, but I think you've said something similar before, haven't you, about... Um... Yeah, I think they changed the format after when Marcus um, was the head judge. They went, they go straight into a skills test now, don't they? Yeah. Whereas I, I feel like I got off lucky. We just had an, um, like random ingredients test. So they just put like five ingredients on the table. We just had to cook something and they eliminated two, two chefs from, from that round. Whereas I would prefer that to, to the skills test straight away. Have you, um, have you watched any MasterChef this year? So I, I like, like, um, like Stephen said, I actually kind of get to this point. I get rid of the uh, first 
first round and then I start watching it from the semi-finals and start start like going through that way um, and how does it feel watching it and not being a part of it does it bring back memories yeah I, I, I had a lovely time and I really enjoyed the whole process um I always think that they should go back and do a winner's winner because I know they, they do a different one now don't they with a Christmas one where they get people who haven't won and they kind of go back on but I, I would really like it for all the winners to kind of go back on I thought they might have done it at 12 when they got yeah. to season 12 like um when they had 12 winners and kind of push forward I think that might have been quite a fun who would you look forward to having in the MasterChef kitchen with you then out of all of the all of the winners I mean obviously Stephen's up there <laughs> I think, I think because I know Stephen, um, I think, yeah, going back and seeing uh, Stephen, um, I, I think all, I think it would be just enjoyable just to kind of all be together and kind of ex how our experience have changed through all of it, I suppose. I, I'm trying to think now who out of all of the winners would be the most competitive, like who would want that winner's winner title? I think Mark, I think Mark wants it. <laughs> That's what I suggested it. <laughs> but I did, I like, yeah, like Mark, I did think like why don't they should do one? But then I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to cook up against like like all the ever winners. That's like quite daunting. That's a good old list of people to have in that kitchen, isn't it? Yeah. I think yeah. it'd be good fun. I think it would be yeah, I, I wouldn't yeah. mind listening to any of them. Okay, okay. I <laughs> But that's the thing though isn't it like as you're going through the rounds you're almost just like i need to win this round i need to get through i don't want to lose to the to these shows. yeah um and, and i think i think even when you go through the rounds you're like oh i'm sure i could beat him i'm sure i could beat him I sh my food's better than his like i think you go through all of the rounds just going well actually out of the i don't know if you're in the group and it's the six of you actually i'm not the weakest one here or yes. you put that um, pressure on yourself to make sure yeah you i think you do and I think it's only. I think I think I, when I got to the final, I was. I don't really mind what happens. Yeah. Because I, for, I never really, I never really thought, oh, I want to win this. I never like it was. It was never about the winning. It was about kind of just going on and, um, taking part, I suppose. But as you're going through, you're like, oh, I could probably beat him. I could beat him. But then when it got to the final, it kind of didn't really matter. I feel like it'd be really interesting because you all know what to expect. So if all of you, you know, you wouldn't be going in blind. You've all experienced it. I feel like it would just be such a completely different, different show. And it possibly, Stephen, you could have your live final as part of that, yeah. couldn't you? Because you said that it should be a live final. So yeah. I'd really <laughs> stitch myself up if they do that. <laughs> yeah you might, you might have to put the three strike system in i might just wind them up <laughs> <laughs> um obviously winning master chef was uh, an amazing experience and um, moving on up, on from that has it opened doors for you do you think being the winner of winner of master chef i think it's a great thing to just uh, have on your cv i think people know know a little bit more about you kind of see they can research you a little bit more so it kind of does open up different avenues in that sort of sense um obviously uh, Stephen's done amazing well out of it and got his own restaurant and um, whereas um, I haven't got my own restaurant I'm still working as um, a head chef somewhere so um yeah I think it I think it I think when it won things went a bit mental and I think people need to kind of understand that that actually and if you're in a place where people can come and try your food you will get bombarded you, I mean, you did say uh, after the competition that it was tiring, exhausting and emotional, <laughs> but it was a fun ride. <laughs> it was. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think I like going down to London, staying over in London, going into the set like at seven o'clock in the morning, like constantly always. You don't know when you're going to be called, what day it's going to be, whether it's I don't know, a Wednesday, I think through the last two final weeks of MasterChef, I was uh, in London pretty much for, I think I came home for two days, then I was off to Italy for three days, then I was back. And then the final was on a, I think I came back on the Monday and the final was on a Wednesday. So they were like, you might as well just stay in London. So you literally go away for quite a while at a time, just trying to do the filming, then having to come back, go and come back. Yeah, I mean, we, we discussed that. I think it was last time, wasn't it, Stephen? Like how, how like tiring it is um especially if you're working as well like you're still working your full 
full-time job at the same time I feel like over those 10 weeks I was like cooking top of my game just because you were I was co- literally cooking every single day I think on the Thursday they came and did the filming at kind of where you work and a little bit of your backstory then Friday you're told to go to Heathrow you're having to write your menu and ingredient list and method in the airport for them to then submit for the final dishes that are then going to be placed on the on the Wednesday um so you go fly to Italy you're in Italy Friday Saturday Sunday come back Monday Tuesday you have a day I had a day off in London and then they were like oh if you need to get any bits of equipment that you need or um plates or bits and pieces and then Wednesday you've got the final so you're still trying to do all the writing trying to get all the ingredients um any, any props you want or um I, I had actually somebody send some stuff down from the kitchen uh the Aubrey Allen came and picked some stuff up from Eckington and actually delivered it to London with some meat and some veal stock that I wanted personally so they delivered some of my equipment for me. and the thing is people watching have no idea do they um that all of this is going on no. when <laughs> like writing, writing all the recipes and, and all of the ingredient lists was just relentless yeah, I think that's something that people don't realise. When you said about being in the airport, I do remember, I think I was actually on the plane and I had to, we were like writing our, writing our menus and they can't match either. You know, like no. if, a, if a chef chooses a certain ingredient, they come back to you and say like, both of you have chosen to, but decide between the two of you who's, who's going to do it. I suppose you, you need to be the one that submits your recipe first then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get it in quick. <laughs> Um, Mark, we, we touched on the fact that you, you obviously have done uh, competitions before. Is that why, was MasterChef just on your list of things that you wanted to do? Was that the reason be- behind you applying or was there another reason that you that you put yourself uh, through it? Uh, yeah, like I said, I've done a few competitions and I, I really enjoyed them. But it's only a friends and family who'd actually said, oh, I think maybe you should apply. I saw it as a, just a Facebook advert. Um, applying for MasterChef and I thought oh, you, I might as well try and go for it. Did you have a set like how far you wanted to get get through or was it I'm going to apply because I want to win or if I get to this point I've, I'll be happy? <laughs> I think when every, everyone says oh, I want to get to the the chef's table and cook for the chefs um, but I, I, don't just, I just wanted to keep going and just keep show, showcasing the food that like I was cooking and I enjoy eating enjoy cooking enjoy eating um and as long as I was happy with every dish that I put up I kind of I kind of didn't really think oh if I'd put up a dish and I was like oh my god that was dreadful like what was I doing I would have I, wa- I would have wanted to go home <laughs> Stephen is that something you can kind of relate to yeah I remember putting up a dish that I wasn't happy with um and it was actually for the critics um and I don't know why, I try, you know, like like you said, writing the recipes, you're like, why did I, why did I submit that that dish? It was like literally like a vanilla panna cotta with pear, and I'm like, it's just like, you know, nothing's like jumping out. Like, and then when I'm cooking it, I'm like, oh, this is like, not great. Well, I remember, I remember, because when I submitted your, uh, when you submit the signature dish, which is the first one you cook um, after the skills test, and then you have to submit the. Uh, critics one at the same time and yeah. um, I remember putting a pudding on there and I was like yeah that's lovely that's lovely and I remember trying it at Eckington and I was like oh yeah and we were just trying it over and over again tweaking the recipes and Sue just turned around to me one day and was like Mark is rubbish <laughs> and I was like no no it can't be it can't be I was like no 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 she's like Mark it, it, it doesn't show skill it's the flavor's slightly wrong so like I remember just going, well, it, it's going to have to do. It's going to have to do. She's like, no, we'll just come up with a new one. That's good. Though. But that, that's what you need. You know, we we're talking about earlier, like what is a um, good experience to go on the show. I think you need to be able to take criticism. Yeah. I mean, yeah you, but- you're getting criticised on the show by Monica and uh, Michelle Rue or, or Marcus and, and Greg. Like people react differently to that, you know, like in the green room. Some of them are like, that's a load of shit. Like, you know, that's that's not that's not right. But I think if you've got that group of people behind you when you are testing the dishes out, that can honestly say, Mark, that's not right. Mark, you know, that's what you want around you, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and I think 
not it was to take that criticism. No, and and it, but I I wasn't happy to take the criticism because I was like, no, 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 it, it's got to be, it's got to be yeah. that dish because you put so much into it, and yeah. then actually when somebody says, oh, you need to start again, you're a bit like, no. Are you able to resubmit that dish then? Uh, I changed uh, before I before I'd actually put in the recipe. I'd completely changed it. Good call. Okay. <laughs> Have you seen any good tantrums in the green room then? I tell you what, I, I saw one with um, there was a lad who had been working at uh, Hand and Flowers and he created some dessert for a skill test with um, it was just an ingredient, like they kind of give you the ingredients, you've got to make a dessert. And he made something with, I think, just peaches and he put a sabo on, on top. And Marcus just went ballistic at him just okay. in front of everyone and even like the cameras are rolling and I, I remember the cameras even then saying like Marcus you need to stop really? and they actually turned to I think because he knew that this guy could cook really well and he was representing the hand on flowers I could you could just see in his eyes that he just went whoo, lost it okay so I wasn't expecting Marcus to be the one having a tantrum <laughs> It was, um, that was the end of the, yeah, that was funny. Literally, you stood there going like that. Thank God he's going home. <laughs> I remember now, like, everyone had their own little pattern in, in the green room. Because you, you know, like, use a certain locker, you use a certain chair, that, like, literally all, all three of us in the final had our own, like, that's my chair, that's my locker. <laughs> but you'd come in and even though it wasn't named or anything, that's where you'd go to because it had done you so well. Um, all throughout the competition, it was a little bit like superstitious. Oh, that's interesting. It's like not cleaning your boots yeah. <laughs> for a match. Yeah. <laughs> did you? Did is that something you heard, Mark, or is that just a Stevens year thing? I think it might have just been a Stevens year. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think it's the footballer coming out of him. Yeah. <laughs> did you enjoy being on TV, Mark? Yeah, I really loved it. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, I thought it was good fun and, and enjoyable. Um, like I said, I enjoyed the whole process of, I suppose, meeting all the crew and finding where they source everything and kind of getting to know those sort of people as well as kind of competing. Yeah. I kind of enjoyed the process of seeing how the, how, the pro, how the film or how the TV show was made as well as competing. Yeah. I would say, is it quite interesting to see how much actually goes into that kind of final product? Because what you, what you get at the end of it is, is not much compared to how long they're filming you for and how long you're in the kitchen for and all of that. There's it? also the amount of food. The food that they order is unreal. And then it's like, oh, you haven't used it. I'm going to take it home. I can't remember. There was a guy who's taking home like two and a half turbots to put on a barbecue. <laughs> because like, you're like, oh, I only need one fillet of turbot. So I've ordered a massive fish. So I've just taken off that little bit and they're like, oh, I'm going to take that home. So he's going home with like, it must be like close to 80 quid port, like 80 quid fish. He's just walking home with his fish. The crew are eating like kings over those like <laughs> weeks of filming. In, on the, in my chef's table dish, I ordered like six pig's heads. I wanted like, uh, I think four racks of um, suckling pig. Uh, couple of I can't remember what else I wanted and I got in six whole suckling pigs <laughs> that's like what do you want me to do with these they're like oh if you don't eat them like we'll just take them home you can literally order in whatever you want whatever you wanted yeah so was there anyone uh, in either of your years that was well actually no Stephen I think you said Adam Hanlon was the one that was was the extravagant orderer <laughs> Mark, were you that guy or was there someone else that was ordering no, it more than you? I, no, I think that was all right, actually. I remember Scott in my year, he brought a lot of his stuff because he was using it at um, uh, the Grove. He he actually brought brought in a lot of his own ingredients, the, the stuff that he wanted, whether it's, I don't know, Tasmanian truffles or whatever it was. He was actually bringing his own stuff, own stock in because he didn't think that they could get it. What was the most um, kind of uh, significant impact winning has had on you is it is it being recognized or is it something within like uh the industry like wh what's the most significant impact it's had on your life well my wife said that she wouldn't marry me if I didn't win so I think I've got to, <laughs> put, it, I've got to put it down to that haven't I <laughs> 
That's why she was telling you dessert was rubbish. <laughs> it all makes sense now. Yeah. Not falling into place. <laughs> um, <laughs> and did how did you feel about being kind of recognised? You said uh, earlier that it all goes a bit mad, doesn't it? If, when you win and if you've got... A, you're in a restaurant and people can come and actually see you. Um, no, we, yeah. we found out over the past five episodes, Stephen loves it. He loves being recognised even now. But... Of course he does. <laughs> That's why he's so well kept. <laughs> uh, what about you? When, it, when, when, it, when he won, it was going into the restaurant every night and trying to talk to people and everyone wants to kind of hear about your experience, um, know what, how you found it but it was literally all the time. Every single table you kind of, they wanted to see you, they wanted to speak to you, they wanted to meet you. It, and I was never really that person before, but I think it kind of made me a little bit more confident in myself, made me a little bit more outgoing, able to speak to people a little bit better, um, kind of have the confidence to go and do that. Whereas before I was a little bit more reserved and shy and just wanted to be in the kitchen, stood behind the stove and cook. Um, whereas actually being forced into that position, I, I suppose kind of brought something else out in me. Do you think it's made you a, like a, a better kind of chef or anything like that? That kind of being I think forced I out of your comfort zone? Handle people better now. I think uh, being put in the, that sort of position, um, we did a we did a takeaway van during like all the lockdowns and literally people coming up to the door and just kind of having the conf confidence to have conversations with them, whether they're 18 years old or 85 years old like having the confidence to be able to kind of turn your hand and speak to anyone I think came from kind of the MasterChef process of pushing myself in that aspect. My role now is probably like 50-50 like serving guests or talking to guests as well as you know like helping George the head chef in the kitchen like I, th I think it's quite I, I don't know I, I actually like doing it because I feel like I've got even more control um, you know, when you're in the kitchen, you're you've got control of the chefs, and then that's where the conflict comes between the chefs and the waiters. Whereas I think now I like to be between the two, um, and like I think just by talking to guests, it it kind of puts them at ease as well. You know, if they if they've got an issue or a, or a complaint, if they talk to a chef, it's like nipped in the bud straight away. Whereas if it's for a waiter, a waiter can frustrate them more um they get even more annoyed you, you know I just think it's I think it's a nice role compared to how it used to be with like Gordon Ramsay Mark you mentioned obviously that you'd like a um a winner's winner um is there an element that you would like to add to the show that you think would make it more more watchable that isn't currently part of it um maybe kind of turn it into like a squid sort of game sort of scenario <laughs> <laughs> They get eliminated completely. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, don't know. I, I think the judges, uh, I think the critics table is a bit maybe old. I think now, I think whether they were people who had been on the show before, like the, maybe the winners kind of going in and sitting and trying the dishes before they go to the Michelin starred chefs or bits and pieces, somebody with a bit more experience, I think going and cooking for, William Sitwell or um, those sort of people I think maybe I think maybe the contestants might benefit a little bit more than just kind of oh they're a food critic okay. maybe a little bit more mentoring maybe I, I really used to enjoy the um, Australian MasterChef and kind of seeing how people progressed and grew through the competition whereas I don't think the UK MasterChef is, uh, they don't grow into the role, they just grow in confidence, whereas they're not learning, they're not um, like trying different things. Maybe instead of critics, you could make it more like real life and get three random people from the streets <laughs> to a uh, TripAdvisor style <laughs> market. Oh, God. <laughs> I feel like that would be quite contentious. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would go down very well. <laughs> we've, got a vegan, we've got a vegan, a dairy intolerant, and uh, we've just got to go cook for them. Yeah. And not allergy. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's got an allergens test. Oh, right. 
Um, what, what skills test did, did you do? Remind us, Mark. What was your skills test? I had crepe Suzettes. Okay, and how did that go? Yeah, fine. Yeah. It was funny then, like, as watching the show, you then watch people trying to make them and think, like, how are you, how are you making this a problem? <laughs> this, got, this has got to be the easiest thing we've got to do. Yeah. Surely your dish that you're going to do next is harder than crepe Suzettes. Yeah. Stephen, I feel like that's quite a, that's a, that's a good one, that one. That, that's a, yeah, if you get that, you'd be okay. Yeah, that's a nice, like I said, I, I had a nice one as well. I yeah. think if you can't, everyone puts so much pressure on the skills test because it's the one thing they're dreading. So as soon as you see something that you're capable of doing, you're like, result. Yeah. Oh, I think I saw one the other day and it was like uh, sausage, sausage with onion gravy. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a skill test. <laughs> Mark, Mark wants it harder. I just want them to cook a piece of toast or something. But like, <laughs> you know, like the uh, like the colour of the toast is what cheese on want. toast without burning the edges. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Mark, what skills test would you test then if it uh, uh, set if it was if it was for you? Making hollandaise, um, fillet, filleting fish, like working in a in a restaurant that does fish, and um, we've got a fishmonger's downstairs. Just seeing people butcher fish is heartbreaking. Mm. Like, yeah. so I'd like to, I'd like them to go in. Oh, you've got, I don't know, you've got six bream to fill it in twenty minutes. Like something, something hot that's not necessarily cooking. Something that's actually, oh, I don't know, you've got to prep four chickens or these different animals, or you've got to bone out a leg of lamb. Or I was going to say like bone a pig's trotter. I think that bit. Okay. I haven't seen that one before. Just watching people making a hash out of food is is heartbreaking. Do you think sometimes the skills tests are not necessarily about the chefs and it's more about the audience and what, what they can relate to? Because not many people are, are doing the sort of things that you're saying, but they are making sausage with onion gravy. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe Marcus has just got a new book out and he wants to kind of promote <laughs> it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, 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 th I think, it, but th that's kind of why Greg's there, isn't he? Greg is there as the interpreter from uh, uh, Marcus and Monica. They can't be the ones seem to be making the uh, silly sort of questions about, oh, what's a, what's a hollandaise? So Greg Wallace is there as that kind of mediator yeah. between public audience and professional chef. He's the kind of mediator in, in between, kind of coming up with those little comments, um, which I think he's unfairly seen for because I think oh what's a greengrocer just kind of doing on there I think that's kind of what a lot of people think but I think he's just a mediator in between Marcus and Monica and I suppose the public at home. So the vibe I'm kind of getting off everybody that we've spoke to so far Stephen including yourself is that you want MasterChef to be more challenging for the people that are coming after you so you get to watch it yeah. <laughs> and not have to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of questions from the audience, um, just from Instagram. Uh, what would your death row meal be? Mark, do you want to go first? Uh, I love pizza and burgers, so uh, uh, any one of those. Okay, any particular pizza or? There's a, a, an amazing place just around by us um, called Fat Tony's and they do a 24 inch pizza that's like a sharing pizza, but they do, uh, I just really like traditional kind of Napoli sort of style with buffalo mozzarella and basil on top, loads of oil, sourdough okay. crust. Sounds good, with a side of burger. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember in Australia, I, I went round trying to find the best burger in, in Melbourne and I had some amazing, because the burger scene when I was out there, like everyone went mental for burgers, um, whether it was brioche buns, like the patty, like literally everything, there was so much um choice and it was so like hot at the minute um i remember just going around just trying so many and what what constitutes the best burger and did you find it i, I got to have a, a, an amazing bun it's got to be soft enough that you can kind of get in your mouth not massive the patty's just got to be just right like not crumbly um not too thick the meat <laughs> you've got a real tick box list oh, here okay. <laughs> I think burger reviews you should yeah. go around 
burgers. Go around, go, yeah, go around Australia, like reviewing burgers. <laughs> Stephen, your death row meal. It's, I, I say it all the time. It's like steak and chips with like bad A sauce, but I want one of those like big tomahawk steaks or one of those ones wrapped in gold from Salt Bay. <laughs> don't get me started. You afford it. <laughs> I don't have to pay for it, do I? But it doesn't matter if it's my well anyway. Put <laughs> on credit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Also, uh, do you have tattoos, either of you? If you do, what are they? Where are they? And what was the inspiration behind them? I'm out of it. I'm a chef without a tattoo. <gasps> oh, God. You're novel. I have got a few, so. He's a rare breed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, I've got a few. Um, I've got uh, a packet of love hearts on my uh, on my ribs with uh, C's initials of like the love hearts falling down and one of them like it says like love hug me and then her initials in one of them. Um, okay. Yeah, I've got a few. Uh, got yeah, a few more. How many? He's not got. A, I got a, quite a big one on my back that's got um, uh, for for my family. Um, I've got a pin up lady on my arm. I've got some on the inside of my ankles. Okay. Well, if, you... if I could, I'd have loads. Okay. <laughs> and what was your first one? I got um, I I got five stars tattooed on me, um, like my my brother, my sister, me, and my mum and dad, and I got it done in Liverpool. And um, this the person I was with at the time said, like, "Oh, should we go and get a tattoo?" I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I remember just walking into this tattoo studio. And he was like, well, what do you want? And I was like, uh, I don't know, can you put five stars on my back? So this guy did it. And I remember coming out and I was bleeding. There were blisters. And I was like, oh my God. And I remember looking in the mirror after it kind of healed and then like half of the stars were missing. Oh my God. <laughs> Is that something you've had touched up or covered up? Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, had, I've had them touched over now. Okay. <laughs> Stephen, is it something you would get done? I know you haven't got one, but would you get one? I do. Um, I mean, I do think about it. I just, um, I know I change my mind all the time on stuff. So I'm just scared to like make a decision and then have it there for the rest of my life. Right. Okay. Okay. That's it. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I said about the five stars, I thought it was going to be his like TripAdvisor rating. That's yeah. <laughs> what, three Burgers. And a half? No, three and a half. <laughs> um, Mark, for people that don't know, um, what are you up to at the minute? What's um, what's on the cards for you um, over the next the next twelve months? So I'm currently the head chef of um, the Seven and White Smokery in uh, Gloucestershire. Uh, it's a, a restaurant, uh, deli, uh, fishmongers. Um, the company that kind of uh, oversee it all is a smoke sam smoke salmon company that do smoke kippers haddocks um, called Seven and White. Um, we've actually, I spoke to you just before we came on here, we actually went and did two weeks in the factory because of the shorts, uh, the, the shortage of staff kind of in the industry. Um, they're down 80 members of staff, so 15, 15 of us from the barn all kind of went over and helped them for two weeks, uh, which was a bit, it was an insight for us to kind of see what, what they kind of do on that side of it and the processes that they go through. Uh, so it's nice to kind of come back with that knowledge back into the kitchen. Stephen, down 80 members of staff. No, that, that took my breath away, that. Um, yeah, the, com the, company run at, the company run at two, uh, nearly 240, but we're at 160. That's across yeah. them three, three factory sites um, and uh, the barn. Uh, but it's just the after COVID and um, Brexit, I think a lot of our foreign staff left um, and went back home uh, obviously um, a few family issues kind of kind of crept into that as well but it just then it was just a kind of snowball effect to that more people left the people that had been kind of carrying on working there were then just working a bit harder then they got burnt out and then they just walked and left and we just kind of had a massive snowball effect um, we're now at a, a kind of massive breaking point so for anyone who's listening you are recruiting I think everyone's done, they? I think the whole <laughs> county sector. <laughs> yeah, no, very much so, very much so. And, um, you mentioned before, obviously, you don't you don't have uh, your own 
restaurant. Is that something in the future that you would want to do? Uh, I think myself and Sue would like to kind of own a pub together. Okay. Um, and we want that. I, I would like our children to kind of grow up in that sort of pub environment where they kind of get to see people, get to speak to people. Um, I think it's important for them uh, being able to speak to the older generation and kind of mingling. Um, that would be something that I would look to be doing yeah. when they're, in, I think two and four is a little bit younger at the minute. Okay. So a pub in Australia that serves burgers. Amazing. There you go, <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> right. Well, uh, that is it. You have made it through uh, Grilled. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck with, the, with everything, obviously hopefully recruiting some staff that would be great wouldn't it so yeah that would be uh, that would be helpful <laughs> um and Stephen a pleasure as always thank you very much great to catch up with you both yeah and uh maybe I might get you uh, all back on for a winner's winner if that show happens that would be yeah. fun wouldn't it <laughs> oh I think you'll get I think you're offering to take us all out for a drink and getting us smashed <laughs> we can do that as well <laughs> oh perfect <laughs> Right, thank you both. I'll let you go and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks very much.